All right. Well, again, if you are visiting with us, this is normally not the way it works. All right, <laughs> promise. Normally not the way this goes down. Uh, but for this uh, for this Sunday, um, I'm like a kid in a candy shop, uh, getting to preach God's word and lead worship. Uh, two things I love, and so just uh, just honored uh, to have the opportunity uh, to do it. And we have a great uh, great text today. But again, if you're visiting with us, we just want to say a, a special welcome uh, to you. Come back next week when uh, I won't be doing everything. Um, please, and uh, don't let me run you off. Uh, but uh, but we are, we're really glad that you are uh, here with us. Uh, Josh uh, said it, we say it every week, uh, but this is a safe place uh, for you to be. Uh, I know, um, especially here at Christmas time, maybe even there would be folks here that are exploring the things of God. Uh, it's all out there in the culture, and you wonder, is there something more than materialism and Black Friday and shopping and, and all of this? Is there something more to Christmas than that? And the answer is yes, there, there absolutely is. And so we're going to be looking at that uh, these four weeks. Uh, just a wonderful series. We've been so excited as we've been talking about it to delve into the Psalms, uh, some, some light, hopeful um, uh, scriptures uh, to encourage us at this uh, time of year and just think about what it means that God is with us as our God. And so it should be a great uh, time. Um, and so we're, uh, we're excited. And so if you want to just go ahead and open up your Bibles into Psalm uh, 145, uh, that's where we'll be uh, this morning, Psalm 145. And, and what I want to do as you're, as you're turning there, even before we read our text, just, just kind of want to put this message into and in somewhat of a, a bigger context. I'm sort of, um, I've learned this about myself over the last few years. I, I really am about the big picture um, and about the forest rather than the trees. Nothing against trees, uh, but I like to look at the broad landscape of things and, and just take it all in and enjoy um, kind of the big picture of things rather than kind of getting bogged down in the minutiae and the details. And so um, kind of that analogy frames a little bit what we're going to be doing uh, in this text, with this text, with this message um, this morning. Um, and so I want us to think about just how, how, how would we look at Scripture and think, even as Christians, about Christmas um, how would we do that? And I think there's kind of four ways, just kind of want to kind of run through right here at the beginning as we, as we kick off this Advent series and as we, as we think about what does it mean for us to, to be as Christians engaging in Christmas. What, what are four ways that, that people think about Christmas and approach um, that monster? Because that's what it's become in our, in our culture. So the, the first one is, is this. It's what I call the warm and fuzzy full of stuff Christmas, all right? The warm and fuzzy, full of stuff Christmas. Now, this is kind of the generic, nebulous, um, I have in my notes garbage. Maybe that's too harsh. But the kind of stuff that you see on Hallmark, Hallmark Channel, right? It's the warm fuzzies. It's you know, the retailers are even getting in on this, right? It's, it's promoting, you know, peace on earth and goodwill towards men. The Christmas spirit giving to others. And, you know, and then by the way, you know, after you give to others, make sure you spend lots and lots of money on yourself and others, right? Lots of new shiny toys because you need those. This is the time of year the retailers are counting on us to, to do those things. And so let me be like, I'm, I'm perfectly good with peace on earth and goodwill towards men, right? Amen. Let's, let's have peace on earth and goodwill towards men. Yet, Yet, those things don't happen apart from Christ, his first coming and then looking forward to his second coming. That's, that's what Advent is about. That's what that word means, if that's an unfamiliar word to you this morning. We celebrate the Advent, the first appearing of Jesus as a baby boy born in a manger, and we look forward, as Christians, we look forward to his second coming, the time he comes not to, not to deal with sin, Hebrews 9 says, but, but to come and to claim that which is his, to claim a people for himself and to establish a kingdom. And so I'm, I'm all about, again, peace on earth and goodwill towards men, but the warm fuzzies that just kind of are out there in the culture this time of year and that we're just kind of encouraged to just um, go along with, those things have no direct connection to Christ at all. And so as Christians, we would sort of reject the warm and fuzzy, full of stuff um, approach uh, to Christmas. Then there is the nativity scene Christmas. The nativity scene Christmas. Now, now you're thinking, well, okay, this has got to be right, right? Well, the nativity scene, right? We, we, we put it in our courthouse and we, we put this in our yard and this is important, right? This is the Christmas of church plays and many of our Christmas carols. We got Mary and Joseph and no room in the inn and stables and mangers and farm animals and wise men, right? We get wrapped up in the story and imagine details of, of what it would be like to be a young couple giving birth to a, a son in just disastrous circumstances. She goes into labor and they can't find a, a suitable place for her to give birth. 
And so this version of the Christmas story, it might, it might very well be Christian, but especially in a Bible Belt culture like we're in, in Lincolnton, especially in a culture like this, it can sometimes become detached from the actual purpose of Christmas. It can become separated from the whole point of the whole story. It might just be traditions that we've imbibed and made our own, but we don't even remember why these things are important. And so we have the third kind of approach to Christian uh, to Christmas. This is the cradle to cross Christmas. This is the Christmas of the Bible, right? This is good. The Christmas that connects this baby boy who's born in a manger to the redemption of all humanity. We sang about it in those songs we just sang. Um, some, some deep, rich truth that he is the second Adam come and, and wipe out uh, what humanity has, has, has done wrong and come as the second Adam to get things right, to be our representative. Where Adam fell, Jesus comes and he stands in our place. And so this is surely right, the cradle to the cross Christmas, that God took on flesh and he dwelled among us, that he lived this righteous life that none of us could live, that he uh, died on the cross, the death that, on the cross, the death that we deserved, that he rose and pur- to purchase life for all who would repent and believe, that he ascended and one day will return to make all things new, as as I just talked about, to come and bring his kingdom. And so he has indeed come to save us as we just got done singing in that new song. And so to all of this, I want to say amen. This is right. This is the, the Christmas of the Bible. This is the Christmas that we want to keep Christ in. This is the Christmas that we want to tell our friends and neighbors about. And it's what's going to be proclaimed. You've heard about the Christ of Christmas concert that we're having here next, uh, this coming Friday night. It's going to be proclaimed loud and clear there. And so come and hear the gospel message through hip hop. A wonderful, fun thing. Even if you don't like hip hop, and that's not your genre, you come and be blessed. The words will be on the screen. It's going to be a huge encouragement. It may just blow your minds, okay? So come, come and, and, and see that. But... But that's not the Christmas that I want to talk about from Psalm 149, though. Even though that is the right Christmas, again, I'm I'm kind of big picturing here. I want to come back and step back even a step further and look at the broader forecast, um, broader forest, rather, and sort of forecast what it is that indeed God is doing for us. Because if we're not careful, even that very biblical Christmas that Christ came for us, if we're not careful, we can make that inadvertently about us. We can make it all about him coming to save us when actually the purpose of Christ's coming was to bring glory to God and to make much of him, to shine the spotlight on the greatness of God. And so it is true that he came for us. It is true that he came to bring us peace. It is true that he came to save us. These are true things, but they are not ultimate things. And so that's why when we talk about this fourth approach to Christmas, which is where we're going in Psalm 145, um, that's, that, that, that's why we're, again, stepping out to see this bigger picture. And so I'm calling this the God as gift Christmas. That may not make any sense until we do this message, but the God as gift Christmas. And this is the point of it all. The point of it all, it's the point of the no vacancy sign on that inn in Bethlehem. It's the point of the shepherds keeping their flocks by night. The point of angels that we have heard on high. The point of the not so silent night, right? I've always thought that song was misjudged. It wasn't silent in an, you know, where a woman is giving birth and, uh, you know, and, you know, out there in the, you know, right? It, it, It wasn't quiet. You've got animals all around and people and then these rough shepherds show up. It was not quiet. But anyway... Um, it's the point of these Middle Eastern pagans, probably Zoroastrians, the wise men, coming later, coming to worship a Jewish Messiah. The point of our candles, the point of crosses, the point of all of this is that indeed God is coming to be with us so that we would be with him. The, God is, the fact that God is our greatest gift, that is what we are celebrating at Christmas And so just to kind of quickly give you the the biblical scope of things, you can see this is biblical language. 1 Peter uh, chapter 3, verse 18 says that Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, that he would bring us to God. 
So that's the point of the whole thing, that he would bring us and he would reconcile us to God, that we would find God as the treasure, God as the gift. 2 Corinthians 5.17, familiar language here for many of you who um, are Christians. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Then listen, all this is from God who to Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. This is the point. God is reconciling the world, coming and bringing wayward rebels back to himself. And of course, he's doing that through the cross. But again, the point is ultimately that we would be with God. So God comes to be with us so that then we can be with God. 2 Corinthians 4 captures this maybe as as well as anything. God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God uh, to in the face of Jesus Christ. And so he is the, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God is in the face of Jesus Christ. And so what is Jesus coming to do? He is coming to point away from himself to the glory of God and to say that's what it is all about. Yes, Jesus is with us. He is God with us. He is God for us. But Jesus comes as the climax of the whole biblical storyline to restore our fellowship with God after we were kicked out of God's presence in the garden. And so that happened because of sin. That's the way God created all things was that we would be with him. We would be with him as um, his people and he would be with us as our God. But then when sin came into the world there in Genesis 3, very beginning of the Bible, when sin came into the world, that fractured the relationship between us and God. And God, because his eyes are too pure even to look on sin, God, who can't stand imperfection and unholiness in his presence, kicked humanity out of the garden. So the whole long story of humanity has been one of alienation and separation from the one who made us. That's why we seek and search out for happiness in the world. We are longing for the thing that would satisfy us and fulfill us. And the only thing that can satisfy and fulfill us is a relationship with the one who made us. As Augustine says, I quote this all the time, but Augustine, uh, fifth century church father, says that God has made us so that our hearts are restless. He's made us for himself so that our hearts are restless till till we would find our rest in him. We are restless, all of us, until we can find our rest in the one who made us, our God. And so the point of Christmas is God. He is the great gift. He is the great treasure. His his presence is that which brings fullness of joy. And so this morning, as we delve into Psalm 145, what I want to do is just encourage your hearts with the greatness of our God. I want God, by his spirit, to stir in our hearts our affections for this one who came to be with us and to save us. And so turn, if you've already done that, look down and pick it up. Turn your Bibles to Psalm 145. I want to read this for us. Not maybe a Christmas text per se, but I think it's very relevant for us as we celebrate the greatness of our God here in his coming. And so listen to God's word as I read it. If you're new here at the end of uh, this reading, I will say this is God's word and you can just respond by saying thanks be to God. David writes, God speaks to him by the Spirit. He says, I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds, and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all. And his mercy is over all that he has made. 
All your work shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power to make known to the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his words and kind in all his works. The Lord upholds all who are falling and he raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand. You satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He also hears their cry and he saves them. The Lord preserves all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord. Let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. This is God's word. Let's pray as we begin. Lord, just thank you that you are this great resplendent God infinite in holiness and beauty, and yet condescending to meet with us and know us, to come and do everything possible to secure our everlasting joy in the one thing that would satisfy, namely yourself. So Lord, would you open our hearts to praise you and worship you this morning? Would you give us eyes to see your beauty and greatness, I ask, for the sake of your kingdom? Amen. All right, well, if you notice there, I said this is a psalm of David. Probably this is the last psalm um, that he contributed to the Psalter. Um, there's some question here. Uh, the uh, the uh, superscriptions that you see up there at the top, that fancy word, um, a song of praise of David, my Bible says, my ESV translation says, those things aren't inspired by God, right? They, so they may not be um, exactly accurate, although Jewish tradition, Christian tradition has long trusted these things, and so probably this is in Indeed, a song of praise. It's a hymn coming from David. We have no reason uh, to doubt that. But this is the last psalm um, that he um, would have written contributing to the Psalter. Um, And so as we're looking at this, it's it's helpful to see and know that this is actually an acrostic poem. And so if you don't remember uh, way, way, way back then, your high school English, uh, some of you, what an acrostic is, right? That's that that form of poetry where every uh, line begins with a, a different letter. All right, and so uh, verse, uh, verse one there begins uh, with the Hebrew uh, letter Aleph, which is A, and uh, then goes down uh, Beit, Gimel, all the way down through A, B, C, D, kind of et cetera, et cetera. And so all the way goes down. And so really, we can think about this psalm as a, a song of praise to God. It's kind of the A to Z, or if you want to do the Hebrew, um, Aleph to Tav, um, of praise to God. And so this psalm was, was revered and, and seen as very important um, in Jewish tradition, one one rabbi even said um, around the time that actually Jesus was living, uh, one rabbi even um, advocated reading this psalm uh, three times a day. He said that if a person would recite this psalm three times a day, then uh, for sure they would certainly inherit uh, the world that was to come. Um, and so you can see how, how highly they thought of this psalm. Now, I'm not encouraging you to do that, okay? I'm, there, if you recite this three times a day, um, that would be a great thing to do. Your, your worship devotional life would, would no doubt increase. Um, but that is not the way the gospel works, that you just do this and, and then, you, uh, then you inherit eternal life. And so, um, but it does, again, it just reveals how important this psalm uh, was viewed in, uh, in church tradition. And so what I want to see in this psalm or this hymn or this song of praise, because that's really what this is, I want to see five things. Things that this teaches us about who God is. And so the first thing is just this, that God is the glorious. He is the one who is glorious. And so look there at verse one, it says, I will extol you my God and King. David is God's King. He is his anointed one. There is no one over David. And yet he comes and he's bringing praise to his King, a great model for us. No matter our authority or our station in life, that he comes and he is worshiping his God, his king. And so he's coming to to praise him. In the ESV, it says extol, which I don't know about you, but I don't use that word very often. It just means to to praise God, to to bless him, to bring honor to him, to, uh, to lift up. And so here he is praising God and he is blessing his name forever and ever 
And so when we bless and we meditate and we think about the name of God, you see that phrase over and over again in Scripture. It's just a way of, of identifying in, in their, their mindset. The name is identified with the essential character of a person. And so in praising the name of God, you're praising his, his, intent, his, his essential character, the very core of who he is, who he is intrinsically, praising his value and, and inherent worth. And so going on there in verse 2, it says that he will bless his name forever and ever. And it's interesting. I was even talking with a friend this week. It's interesting the concept that we would be called upon to bless God. This friend very rightly was saying, isn't that strange? Like, God is the one who should be blessing us, right? I mean, what do I have to give to the God of all the creation and all the universe, Right? I mean, God should bless us, not us bless him. And yet, exactly, this is what David is saying. He's saying, every day I will bless you. And so what is that? It's not that we're giving stuff to God because he has it all, right? And instead, we are giving him the honor and the worth and the worship that he deserves. This is who our God is. This is what he deserves. And so that's exactly right. We come humbly. We come submissively. We recognize his supremacy and we, his value. And so we give him that and so bless him. And notice that this is this daily thing, daily that this happens. If you look at, at what David is saying here, there are three things. He's, he, one, he is willful in this attention uh, and this intention to bless God. He says, I will extol you. I will bless God. This is something that he is determined to do. It's something that he is committed to. He's purposed to do it. He's not leaving it to chance. But he says, no, I will worship you. I will bless you. This is something that each of us must choose for ourselves. That whether we're going to worship God, or we're going to give ourselves to things that, that ultimately in the light of eternity don't matter. And so he, he purposes intentionally to say, I will worship you. Maybe even a great intentional mindset for, for us to focus on in a season when there are so many parties and things going on and gifts to buy and places to go and family and friends and folks to see. To say in the midst of busy cultural Christmas, I will worship Christ the Lord just like David does. Second, it's regular. Do you see? It says, every day I will bless you. It's regular. And so even as I was reading this, I was convicted thinking, you know, is, is the worship of God a regular daily practice of mine? Is it of yours that daily, regularly, you're coming before him and worshiping him, purposing to do that? Kind of the, the check for me when I think I don't have enough time for these things is that every day, Every day, somehow, I make sure that I eat, right? Are you guys the same way? Do you guys eat just about every single day? Some of you maybe eat, you know, multiple, you know, not, not, not just three meals, but four and five and six, right? I mean, you know, little snacks here and there, right? And so somehow I manage to find time to eat, and yet I don't find time for worship. So again, it's about that willful discipline to say, no, I will do this every day. I will bless you. And then it's also unending. David's praise and blessing of God is unending. He says, I will bless and praise your name forever and ever. And so this isn't something that we just do in this kind of corporate gathering here on Sunday. It's not something that you do for a season of your life and move on to other things. But no, we will bless him forever and ever. Charles Spurgeon uh, the quote master, the mic dropper, uh, says this. He says, Our praise of God shall be as eternal as the God we praise. Think about that. Because God is eternal, we will praise him eternally. He deserves eternal praise because of his character. Every day, every day, there will be new things to praise God for and to bless his holy name. And why is that? Well, look at verse 3. It's because great is the Lord, greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. And so the object of our praise, the, the greatness of our God, instructs us and informs us to praise Him greatly. God can never be praised long enough or loud enough or with high enough words. We can never praise Him and give Him what He truly deserves. And so when we think about Christmas, 
Maybe this is probably a show I'm trying to think that has been on in the background that I've seen on HGTV, but like over the top Christmases, right? With like people, I mean, people go over the top with lights. Maybe that's you. And if it's you, I'll probably bring my daughter, my daughter, daughter by, you know, your house to look at the lights and, you know, get that psychedelic uh, effect of all your lights flashing around and doing that. But we know, we, we know that there are such things as going over the top with things, right? But in our worship of God, there is no over the top. There is no point that we, we do too much that doesn't happen. And so certainly there are forms of worship that can become self-indulgent and sinful. And we try to be careful about that in the worship and the music that we lead here. I'm just saying that as a, as, a, as a worship leader here. But so there are sinful, self-indulgent forms of worship, worship that focus on ourselves and not God. But again, the problem is the, is the focus. God, though, can never be worshipped enough. He can never be praised long enough or loud enough or strong enough or with words enough because we cannot capture His excellency. And so we will spend eternity around the throne of God worshipping Him in fellowship with Him, praising Him because that is what He deserves. His greatness is so great, as verse 3 here says, is that it is unsearchable. The greatness of God cannot be found out. There is no end to it. It goes on and on and on. And so this should strike a little bit at the blow of our human abilities, right? In my lifetime, in some of your lifetimes, we have sequenced the human genome, right? That's pretty impressive. And some of you that that have lived longer, right, the the scientific textbooks that you had when you went to grade school and high school have completely been rewritten and changed, right? Human discovery has grown by leaps and bounds in the last hundred years, right? We have captured photos of the surface of the planet of of Pluto. It's it's not a planet now, right? Again, that scientific change, right? But we know what the surface of Pluto looks like because we sent a satellite out there and took pictures. I mean, how crazy is that? And so we can search the edges of our solar system. We have a vision of what these things look like. And yet we cannot search the greatness of God. Our finite minds cannot grasp his infinite character. The more we press into who God is, the wonders that he is, the more that we see how wonderful and how unknowable he is. And so now, just to take a time out, I have to give you your weekly dose here at Freedom Church of hip-hop, okay? Your weekly dose of hip-hop, just because Clint's not up here doesn't mean that you're not going to get it. So this is from Shylin. He says, I can't even explain the half of it. Our brains can't even fathom it. And language is inadequate to characterize the Lord on the throne with spiritual eyes. His story is known. From him and through him and to him is everything. Surely to God be the glory alone. All right? God is the God for whom language is inadequate. We cannot capture him. Our brains cannot wrap our minds around him and figure him out. And so if you have been in a season of life, if you're going in a season of life right now where you're trying to figure out God, let me just go ahead and save you some exercise and some mental work. You're not going to get there. You're not going to master God and understand everything about who he is and the way he works because ultimately his ways are above our ways and beyond our ways and his character is unsearchable. And so it's wonderful that he has spoken to us in his word. He has given us everything we need to know for life and godliness, but we will not find God out. And that is a good thing. He is the glorious one. His greatness requires daily, eternal praise. And then look at verse 4. It's a greatness that can't even be captured by us here in this room and even the different generations that are represented in this room from those kids out there in the nursery and some sleeping on laps right now, right? They will live beyond most of us, right? But their generation won't be able to capture his fame. Your generation won't be able to capture and declare all his worth. One generation, though, will commend, will praise his works to another, verse 4 says, and and will declare your mighty acts. So this is the way God is worshipped, and this is the way the faith is spread, is that God is worshipped, and our kids catch us worshiping God and then pick that up from us and then worship God as well. One generation praises his work to him. So for you parents here, 
thinking, you know, how do I bring my child up? How do I get my child to embrace the things that, that I believe? How do I introduce them to the God I know and the God I love? And a very real question for me is, Kinley is 17 months now. I'm trying to figure out how do we point this young heart? How do we shepherd this heart to know and love God? Well, the answer just here in Psalm 145 is clear, is that we praise God's works to her that we would declare the greatness of God before her and to her. And so, yes, that means we bring her to corporate worship and that we will take her to Sunday school and we'll teach her God's word. But above and around and in all of that, we are praising the works of God to, him, to her. I commend the same thing for you. So to fuel all of this, again, we're thinking about this God who is glorious David is meditating, he says in verse 5, on the glorious splendor of the majesty of God. He's meditating on this one who is great. And so God's majesty, his majesty, which is his authority and sort of radiance as it is, his greatness, his king, that majesty is so great that around that majesty is glorious splendor. I mean, that's how great this God is. Even his majesty has magnificence. The thing that is magnificent is even yet more magnificent. It's just, it's just mind-blowing. And so we see this in the magnus, magnificence of his creation. It says, on his wondrous works, we will meditate. These wondrous works, these things that he has made, will speak of the might of his awesome deeds. So creation is speaking of his might. And then in verse 7, it says that they will pour forth the fame of God's abundant goodness and sing aloud of his righteousness. So God is not without witness because his creation declares his glories and his excellencies. Psalm 19, one says the heavens are declaring the glory of God. Psalm 97, six says that the heavens are telling of his righteousness. And so both his greatness and his glory and his moral character creation is speaking to and it's pouring it forth abundantly pouring forth the greatness of this God. God's reputation is so great that even creation, even trees and birds, animals worship and praise the God. This is our God. He is the glorious one. And as we're thinking about God with us, this is the God who is with us. God, the glorious. Second this morning, we see God the good. God the good. As David is meditating on this, he's walking through the alphabet, the A to Z of this praise. He comes and he is reflecting and praising God's character. He's the one who is good. And he says that the Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all. His mercy is over all that he has made. He's echoing here Exodus 34, 6 and 7. Two of the most significant verses in the Old Testament, all of Scripture, because it's unpacking who God is. It's God's character. And so we see here that He is gracious and merciful. This one who has all power and all might and is surrounded by glory and majesty and magnificence. He is gracious and merciful, or probably a better translation, some of yours may even do this, will say that He is compassionate. That's the picture here. A God who is compassionate. And so though every human being, except for Jesus, born after the fall, is born as rebels to God, born opposed to God, shaking our fists at God, yet God comes and he is gracious and merciful. He is slow to anger, abounding in love. So God doesn't treat us and respond and interact with us with hot-headed rage. Okay, maybe that's your vision of God. Maybe that's... Uh, Maybe that's your, your vision of God. Maybe you had a, a father or a man in your life who, who acted like that way. And, and so that's your vision for what this God of the Bible might be. But no, Scripture must inform our vision of who God is and who the Father is. It says the Lord is gracious and merciful. He's slow to anger. He extends compassion to all those who repent and believe. And even though a little later on we're going to see that he does have special love for those who are his children, what we see here is, is significant. He is good. And look at verse 9. He is good to all. God's goodness is to all. His hand is kind. His mercy is over all that he has made. 
And so he's not just showing and reserving his goodness and his kindness for a select few. But even though creation itself is in stubborn mutiny against its maker, it's what happened in the fall. So we're in rebellion against him. And even in spite of that fact, God's mercy is over all. So Jesus says that the sun rises on the evil and on the good, right? He causes the rain to fall down and water the ground for both just people and unjust people. So God is merciful and kind. He is a God who maintains love even towards his enemies. I mean, what kind of God is this? Every aspect of him is good. He is good to all. He is so good to withhold his wrath from his children by punishing his son instead. And he is good also to judge wickedness. So this is our God. He is the one who is good. He is the God who is with us. And this goodness is magnified, again, because of God's power and authority. He is the king, right? That's what we're seeing. It's David here praising his king. And so if God were good, but he had no power, you know, what good would that be? He would be sort of a benevolent grandfatherly figure, you know, sitting back in a rocking chair, and he's really good, and you like to talk to him, and he's really nice, but he has no power. He can't do anything. So it would be worthless. Or if God is all-powerful, but he's not also good, if he's all-powerful, then he would be a terrible dictator, right? We would fear him and even maybe hate him because he used his power to do things that weren't right. But in God, we see that he is goodness and power meeting. He is a good king who does good things for those who are his And so he is this one who in all things these attributes meet. He embodies the good and he is our king. And so that's number three. It's God the king. God the king. And so look now at verses 10 and following. It says, all your work shall give thanks to you or all your saints shall bless you. Again, the beauty of his creation is shouting. Creation is shouting. But for those who are here that are the Lord, those who know Christ, As we've been redeemed, we have this special privilege of blessing and praising his name. All your saints, it says in verse 10, all your saints shall bless you. They shall speak. The saints now, us, shall speak of the glory of his kingdom and tell of his power to make known to the children of man his mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of his kingdom. So we have that privilege to declare the worth and the excellencies of our God to the world that he made and is estranged from. We have that opportunity to be, as as, uh, 1 Corinthians 5 says, to be ambassadors for Christ, to be those who would reconcile, seek to reconcile the world to God. And so, but imagine this, what you have here is a king who is being praised by his servants, by his subjects, by those he is over. And so that may be hard for us to fathom in today's political climate, right? Up on Capitol Hill, you've got Democrats and Republicans and kind of cutthroat, bloodthirsty political gains, right? And everybody on other sides, you know, dissing on the president, right? Can you imagine instead everybody unifying around the king or the president and coming and praising his works and praising his character and talking about how wonderful a job he is doing? I mean, that doesn't even make sense with our minds and kind of, again, in our political climate. But that's what's happening when God comes as king. Everyone, there is no naysayer. There is no journalist raking up muck you know, on God. No, all his king, all his subjects are praising his name. Uniformly, they worship him and, and, uh, and don't grumble about his authority and his reign. And not only this, his kingdom, it says in verse 13, is an everlasting kingdom. His kingdom will go on forever and ever. His dominion endures throughout all generations. What king can say that? As we watch empires rise and empires fall, the kingdom of God will remain forever. This is, dear church, this is our God. This is our king. This is the God who came to be with us. We see even more of this in his care for creation. We see that he is the sovereign one. Look here in verse 13, the second half of verse 13. God is the sovereign one. Now let me pause here and do what Clint does. 
and tell you that this is, uh, we have a, a nerd kind of issue to solve. So if you're a nerd, stick with me. If you're not, just take like a 45-minute pause, okay? Uh, and I'm going to bring you back, all right? But, but, but uh, I want you, by the way, to ask Clint about this. Go to him, you know, hit him up on Facebook or, or Twitter. Send him text messages about this question, okay? Because you need his input. So he's always telling you to come ask me things. Um, it's only fair that I should do the same thing to him. But, but you may notice here, um, you may notice that in your Bible, there's, there are brackets around this verse, or there's at least a footnote around 13b, which says something like, the Lord is faithful in all his words and kind in all his works. And so there's an issue here that in some of the ancient Hebrew manuscripts, um, that verse doesn't appear. Now, in other, uh, others, um, it does. And so it's sort of like, okay, is this, is this here or is this not? And so what this is, is again, I told you this is an acrostic. We're working our way through the Hebrew alphabet. And so this verse, 13b here, um, is uh, the letter N, which in Hebrew is noon. And so the question really is, did the psalmist, when he wrote this, did he forget N and, and skip over it, or, or did he put it in? And so um, my, my, my take is, and, and most English translations nowadays uh, include it, think it was original, and so include it in the text, even if they put brackets or a, a footnote or something with us. Um, I think this was in the original text, and so we'll, we'll preach from it. Um, but that's the question that's here. But I want you, again, Clearly, before we move back from nerd talk to the rest of the conversation, I want you guys to hit up Clint and ask him his opinion. Was noon originally in Psalm 145? Ask him that, uh, please. And so anyway, now moving back, new, come back, non-nerds, come back with me. Uh, we want to we continue walking through this text and see, again, the Lord here says he is faithful. He is faithful in all his words and kind in all his works. I mean, what kind of king is like that, who is faithful in all of his words? Again, think about the politicians, our own beloved mayor uh, accepted, right? But think about politicians, right? How many of us can trust every word that they say? How many of them are faithful to all of their promises, right? Except, no, indeed, this Lord is faithful. Our king is faithful to do everything he says. He is kind in all of the works that he does, that's the kind of God he is. And so look at the kind of care he provides as king. He upholds, verse 14, he upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. Just beautiful here. If you this morning feel like you're barely hanging on, you're slipping, you're like the psalmist in Psalm 73 that says, you know, as for me, my foot had almost slipped. My, my steps had almost stumbled God is a God who upholds those who are falling. He catches them right before they trip. And then it says he raises up who are, those up who are bowed down. You might think from that that these are the super spiritual people who are bowed down in worship. But that's not what's going on there in that word. This isn't those who are bowing down in worship, but these who are weighted down, whose backs are bent, who are weary and so tired that they can barely keep going. And that's who this God is, is that he upholds those who are slipping and he straightens the backs of those who are so weary that they can't press on. He is this kind of king who straightens weak and weary backs. This is good news for tired, weary sinners who wonder if we can keep going. Jesus says, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. That is this God, our King, fully accomplishing the work that's necessary for redemption, calling us, justifying us, sanctifying us, one day glorifying us. He is this God who does all the work and says, come, repent and believe and rest in that which I have provided for you. And then look at verse 15 and 16. Just so, so beautiful to see again the compassion of God, the kind of king that he is, this king who is with us. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand and you satisfy the desire of every living thing. He meets the needs of his people. He meets the needs of his subjects. He provides for them. He loves them. He cares for them. He opens their hands. And he gives them what they need, what mercy, what provision. We see his sovereign care, even in the world, even though the world has fallen, you, you still see this in the way that he provides, just through the basic rhythms of creation, the way our ecosystems are even structured, right, and, and food chains. 
We see his good design for all creatures to have something to eat. And so this God cares about deer and lion. He cares about the creepy crawling things that you hate when they get in your house, right? He cares about them just like he cares about elephants and and rhinos. He sustains life for all creatures, even the seemingly insignificant ones. And again, they'll remember who this God is. This is the one who dwells in inapproachable light, who is holy, who created all things by one word. And yet he's concerned about the fish in the stream having something to eat and gently, tenderly providing them that. Providing for buffalo out roaming a prairie. How great is this God that his concern is so deep and so vast. This is our God. He is the sovereign one. This is the God who is with us. And lastly, he is God, the Savior. God, the Savior, in verses 17 and following. What truly just blows the mind is not that he is this God who is far off and mighty and powerful. He is those things. But he is a God who is not distant and oblivious to us, his creation. Instead, verse 18, he is near. He is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. It's a song, I can't remember when it came out. I'm probably going to date myself here a little bit. Maybe the 80s, maybe in the early 90s. I don't know. It kind of sounds like one of those songs. God is watching us from a distance, right? From a distance, you know, whatever. I'm not going to sing it. Um, but that song is, don't get your theology, okay, from the radio, all right? This is a principle, all right? Don't get your theology from the radio. That's, that's bogus. That's wrong. It's untrue. God is not watching us from a distance. He is near. In fact, so near that he would come and take on humanity. He would clothe himself in flesh and come and live among us, be born as a baby, be totally dependent, need everything done for him, The one who sustains the world by his word would need to be fed, right? Need diapers changed and all these things. That's how near our God is. He came to be with us. And so he is forever near to those who call on him. But notice there is this qualifier there. He is there to call, he's there for those who call on him in truth. In truth, and so what this should signal for us is that there are true ways to approach God, or we would say true way, one way to approach God, and then there are other false ways. So we must approach him in truth, and we know as Christians, we know that truth is through the person and work of Jesus Christ. Jesus himself says, I am the way. It's not plural here, right? I am the way. I am the life. I am the truth. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so he is near, yes, to all who call on him, to all who call on on him in truth. And that truth is the person of his son who came and lived, as we've talked about, who came and then died and who rose, who ascended, and who will one day come again. And so don't trip on that truth. Don't trip on the idea that, well, I can just do this and be good. I can meet God in some other way. No, there is one way to come to him. He is the one Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. He is near to all who call on him, all call upon him in truth, coming, coming fearfully, coming humbly, crying out for mercy, acknowledging his greatness. Look at this. He hears their cries in verse 19. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He hears their cry and he saves them. And so he is near to those who recognize their need for a Savior who recognize that they don't have things figured out and want to come and cast their selves on him and say, here, God, I give my life to you. Will you save? Will you rescue? For those that would do that, they find that indeed, as Psalm 16 says, that in his presence is fullness of joy. At his right hand are pleasures forevermore. Again, this is the point of Christmas, that God comes as the gift God comes, even in the person of his son, as the great gift that we would know him, God, with us. We would come and find him and find in him life and find in him joy. His steadfast love, David says in Psalm 63, is better than life. And so clearly God is good to all. We we saw that earlier in verse 9. He is good to all. 
but he is especially good and loving for those who are his children. You, those of you with kids, right, know this, right? You love family members, you love other people, but you really love your kids, right? And that's the way God is. God has a general love, a common grace that he extends over all of his creation, and he has special love for those who are his, for those who are his children. So you need to know this morning, if you are a child of God, that God pursues you and loves you with special choice love. So maybe you're struggling, you're weary, life is beating you up. As pastors, we, we know, we're aware just of some of the things that, that face you. And so we know just the way that life can be so hard. Brokenness can be so tragic, so deep. And yet God has got you if you are his. He's got you. He loves you. He cares for you. He upholds you. He hears your cry, it says, and saves you. The Lord preserves, verse 20, he preserves all who love him. So if that's you this morning in a struggle, in a fight, know that the Lord preserves you. He will preserve you if you are his. But at the same time, there's another word here that we would um, be remiss if we didn't say. Verse 20, he preserves those who love him, but all the wicked, it says, he will destroy all the wicked he will destroy. This goes back to, to Exodus 34, 6 and 7. Yes, he is the God of steadfast love who is gracious and merciful, keeping steadfast love for thousands, it says, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. But the rest of that says, but he is the God who will by no means clear the guilty. All the wicked he will destroy, verse 20 says. And so there will be a day, even right now, he is restraining his wrath. He is being merciful. He's being gracious. Even this morning, he's gracious in that those of you who are here can hear the gospel, can hear the word preached, can worship him, know him. But there's coming a day when all the wicked he will judge. And so maybe you wouldn't consider yourself to be wicked, but scripture says that anyone who is outside of Christ, anyone who has not fled to him for refuge, as a payment for their sins, you are wicked. Scripture says all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. So I would urge you this morning, if you're a seeker, again, this is a safe place for you to be. I want you to seek in this Christmas season, but seek us out. We want to talk to you about this. We want you to flee from the wrath of God that will come uh, one day. Even though right now he is being merciful and extending that time, again, enjoy that mercy, but use that mercy that you might find salvation and hope and joy and peace in the one who has provided it, this great God, this great king, because this is who our God is. He is the God who saves. This is the God who is with us. And so, dear friends, this morning, again, the point is to see the point of Christmas. The point of Christmas is that the great God, the great God is this gift. He is the glorious. He is the good. He is the king. He is the sovereign one. He is the savior. So our great joy here at Christmas is not simply a baby in a manger. It's not, it's not simply that, although that's part of it, that's integral to it. But the joy is that this baby in a manger is none other than Emmanuel, God who is with us, who comes for us to bring us to this great God. An old, old hymn writer uh, put it this way. He gets it exactly right. He says, my goal, my goal is God himself, not joy, not peace, not even blessing, but himself, my God. Friends, may this be our joy and our focus this Advent season. And may we, even as David closes there in Psalm 145, verse 21, may our mouths speak the praise of the Lord and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. Let's pray. Lord, we want to worship you with all that we are, with all that we have. You are great God. Lord, what a magnificent God you are. How merciful, how kind, how gracious, how good, how sovereign. Lord, our minds can't even fathom you. And so we worship 
And yet we say, help our unbelief. Help our worship of that which we don't know. Lord, fill up what lacks in us that we might worship you more truly. Because God, you are this wonderful God. And so we pray that we would worship you truly and rightly and with all our hearts. So Lord, would you help us to do that? Help us even to make space, Lord, for that which is most important in this busy time of year. And help us not to forget, even in the the, the hustle bustle, even the things that we do here at Freedom, God, we pray above all that we would remember that you are the God who is the gift. You are the treasure. You are the joy. You are the satisfaction. You are the life. So Lord, grant that we pray or that we, your people, would be a joyful people who worship your name. We ask uh, for the sake of Christ. Amen.